Hello and welcome to the Institute of Coding, OUASC, Free CCNA CyberOps Instructor Training. My name is Kevin Large and I'll be your instructor for these sessions. Well, we're now on Chapter 1, Cybersecurity and the Security Operations Center. It is now 8 o'clock and 10 seconds, 11 seconds, on my super accurate atomic clock powered by a Raspberry Pi. And um, I think it's time that we should get into a little bit of cybersecurity. Uh, <laughs> hello, everybody. Yeah. Coding Lion, my goodness me, you are. Uh, I think I owe you a medal for um, persistence. My goodness, sir. Uh. Okay, um, yeah, it's good to see everybody again. I recognise quite a few uh, names from uh, previous uh, sessions this this evening. Um, session number three. Hopefully, I can keep it together um, on these, and um, it should be uh, interesting. <laughs> okay, so um, we're looking at chapter one. Cybersecurity in the Security Operations Center, and this chapter is actually a very light. Uh, it's not exactly an introduction. We've had the introduction to the course, but this is kind of an introduction to the chapters, uh, to the an overview. This is like a bit of an overview, let's say. So it doesn't go super deep technically on this one. Um, so with any luck, um, you know, we won't have to um, do what I did in the IT Essentials session and go slightly over time. I'd like to be at a fingers crossed keep to time on this one. There's lots of uh, likes going up when I said I'll try to keep to time on this one. So, <laughs> all right. So uh, let's get let's let's get started. Um, right. First things first. Um, as you have probably no doubt looked through the online material, um, and this chapter has actually got some really good links to some external videos, uh, TED Talks and the like, where you've got some very experienced, um, I'm not sure whether I should say hackers, um, security individuals um, talking through how various things are done, um, attacks and prevention. So it's definitely well worth looking at some of the videos that uh, there are links to in this chapter one. Okay, looking at um, the very first war story here, uh, we've got a situation where a young lady stopped by a favourite coffee shop to grab a drink. She's placed her order. Um, she's pulled out her phone, opened up a wireless client and connected to what she assumed was the coffee shop's free wireless network. However, lurking mysteriously in the corner of the store, we have a hacker. You could always recognise a hacker because they wear a black hat and quite often sunglasses. Um, no, they don't, unfortunately, if it was only that easy. Um, but the hacker has opened up a rogue wireless hotspot posing as the coffee shop's legitimate wireless hotspot. So a young lady logs into her bank account not realising that the hacker has hijacked her session and gained access to her bank account details. Yep, this, this is how easily these things can be done. There's so much in the way of scripts and very powerful programs now which require very little actual technical understanding in order to use them, um, that things can literally be as dangerous as that sounds. Um, another situation is uh, a very common one, and I've actually seen this personally myself two or three times now. I obviously won't say who they were, who were ransomed, but um, ransomware is very prevalent. Um, so we've got an employee in the finance department of a major public held corporation. He receives an email from his uh, chief executive officer, or at least he thinks it's from his chief executive officer. Possibly it is, but it's got an attached PDF. And this PDF sparks his interest. He doesn't remember his department creating that PDF, so with his curiosity piqued, he opens the attachment. Oh dear, oh dear. Be very, very careful open attachments on emails. Make sure that your email program isn't set to automatically preview attachments or open attachments. When the PDF opens, ransomware is installed on the employee's computer and it begins the process of gathering and encrypting 
corporate data. This is what ransomware does. It pulls the information together um, and then it encrypts it with a very high level of encryption. It normally uses something known as AES or the Advanced Encryption Standard with a nice big key and um, basically once it's encrypted with that with a nice big key then it's it's gone. Um, the only way you'll ever get that information back is if you pay them for it. And I have, as I say, I've had instances I know of companies, organizations where this has actually happened to them. And they've, in most cases, they've actually paid. And to be fair, in most cases, the people who put the ransomware, uh, they bounce the money all around so as it can't be traced. But um, once you've paid for it, normally they will actually unlock the um, information for you. Because obviously if word gets round that paying for it doesn't have any effect because they just don't bother unlocking it anyway, that's not going to be very good. So yeah, more often than not, you pay for it, they unlock it. But the important thing is to make sure that you don't get yourself into that situation in the first place. So always beware of attachments on emails. Um, the next situation is a particularly interesting one. The next situation is targeted nations. Um, as far as malware is concerned, malicious software, um, there kind of was the world as it existed before Stuxnet and the world as it existed after Stuxnet. Um, Stuxnet is a phenomenally powerful piece of software. Um, and what it did was it, it, it basically it infiltrated um, the nuclear facilities in Iran. Um, these were facilities that were used for refining uh, uranium and um, in order to make the uranium usable in uh, power stations or even in atomic weapons. Uh, uranium has to be very pure of a certain isotope in order to be used. And the way they do this is they refine it using big centrifuges and these centrifuges have to spin at a very very precise rate. Um, and uh, what happened basically was um, Stuxnet was designed to infiltrate the Windows operating systems but it, it effectively it lay dormant on the Windows operating systems because the Windows operating systems were not the target of the Stuxnet worm um, they were just a means of getting to the target um, the target was what's known as Step 7 software Step 7 software was developed by the German company Siemens for their programmable logic controllers these were the devices that controlled the speed and monitored the output and the rotation rates and various other parameters uh, related to these centrifuges um, and Stuxnet sat on the Windows computers until ultimately possibly via the means of USB sticks or connecting through a uh, network cable um, these systems were not connected to the internet of course uh, they didn't need to be connected to the internet and probably they thought it was safer by not connecting them to the internet however the Stuxnet worm whether it was by uh, USB sticks or some other means was transferred to Windows computers inside the organization and when those computers connected to the Step 7 software um, this was the prime target for the worm and um, basically what it did was it um, sped up the centrifuges and slowed them down and sped them up again and slowed them down uh, which had the result of um, not only making the uranium that was being processed completely useless um, because they have to spin at such a stable speed but also by rapidly speeding them up and slowing them down it actually caused physical damage to the centrifuges um, I think there was well over a thousand centrifuges which were damaged um, in uh, by this uh, Stuxnet worm. In fact the Stuxnet worm was so sophisticated that um, it used not one, not two, not even three, but four zero-day attacks to make absolutely certain that um, it uh, hit its target and could do the damage that it required to do. Uh, zero-day attack is effectively um, a piece of uh, malicious code which has never been used before and therefore the first instance that it's used is the first time that the cyber defense uh, organizations like Symantec or Kaspersky is the first time they ever see that code um, so uh, they literally have no defense against it um, a zero day attack will always succeed um, on its very first initial um, uh, initiation um, however obviously the, um, the code once it's been seen and analyzed and taken to pieces 
uh, and they've built defences against it uh, at that point then it can be stopped but um, there wasn't one there was four zero day attacks built into the Stuxnet worm that was just how important it was to make sure that this worm did what it was designed to do uh, the level of sophistication in this case was absolutely incredible um, and in fact it was so sophisticated and so expensive to produce that it's uh, believed that only a nation state or a group of nation states working together could have probably created such a powerful worm. Okay, um, I'm going to break out for a little while just so as we don't hit the PowerPoint presentations continuously. Um, you'll remember that on this particular course we make considerable use of virtual machines. Um, now we have a sandboxed environment which consists of four virtual machines um, we've got uh, a firewall router, the security onion we've got um, a metasploitable vulnerable server we've got a Kali Linux machine for attacking from and we've also got a CyberOps workstation and um, there is a lab and the lab is very uh, close to the start of the chapter and in that lab it explains to you precisely how you go about setting up VirtualBox now, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to switch across to that lab. Um, bear with me just one second while I move the web page around. Let's see if we can do this. What I'm hoping to do is I'm hoping to bring up that lab. Let's see, that's better. Okay, so um, part way in, we've got. Um, a lab where we're installing the CyberOps workstation. So if I click on that link, it will bring up the instructions to go about installing, first of all, Oracle VirtualBox, and then downloading the virtual machine image. The virtual machine image is about 3 gig in size. Um, I've already downloaded the virtual machine image and I've already installed VirtualBox. So we can go about installing that onto VirtualBox. I'm just looking very quickly to see if it says the username and password. There we go, there's a username and password. So let's have a little look at doing this. Um, let's do it for real as though that's precisely what we're about to do. Um, there we go, there's uh, Oracle VirtualBox. This was installed on my system that I'm using to record the videos. Um, that is, let me see if I can show you. Might be easier to do that from the top. Um, applications system. Um, I'm running a Linux machine obviously VirtualBox will work perfectly well on a Windows machine or a Macintosh. Um, I'm going to go to add remove software. This is a Manjaro Linux machine um, like I say if you've not used it before I definitely recommend it. It's a very fast, very stable. It uh, tends to detect all your hardware very well. Gone are the days in Linux where you had to be some kind of Jedi Knight in order to use it. I mean if you want to do really powerful things with it you do need to still have some Jedi Knight like genes in your uh, DNA but um, it's a lot easier to use than it once was. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to do a search for Oracle VirtualBox and you can see I've got a remove button here which indicates that it's already installed however um, on this system it's simply a case of going to the add remove software and tapping in what you wish to add and uh, clicking on the install button, tapping in your password and away you go. In a Windows machine of course it would just be a matter of going to uh, the Oracle VirtualBox download site on the internet and downloading it and doing your usual next 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 finish. Um, actually while we're here I just want to check a couple of other bits of software which we'll have a little look at later on. Wireshark Good, Wireshark's installed. I had a feeling I'd probably installed that. Um, what else should we play with? Um, VSFTPD, very secure file transfer protocol daemon. That's a FTP server. Um, that is not installed. Hey, so I can show you how you install something now. That's good. So we'll do an install. And I'm hoping apply. It will ask for my password. Okay. Uh, that's just a little warning. I don't think that should cause any problems, I'm hoping. 
So it's going to install VSFDPD, that's a file transfer protocol daemon or a file transfer protocol server. Um, I'm hoping that neither of the other two will break anything. That is one thing with Linux, um, you do tend to be your own technical support, so if something breaks, then uh, you're the person who ends up fixing it. Okay, you can see that we're downloading some packages now. It looks like Thunderbird had to be updated, my email client, so unfortunately it's doing that as well, so that'll take just a little bit longer, but hopefully not too long. It's already downloaded the file transfer protocol FTP server. Um, okay, all done. Transaction successfully finished. So that's how difficult it is to install software on Majero Linux. Not difficult at all. Okay. Um, I want to do a couple of things now. One is I'll bring that uh, web page back up again. Okay, and what we'll do is we'll go and ah, uh, hold on, we don't need to do that. Sorry, my fault. It has been a bit of a long, long evening. Um, this is the lab, the lab that we got to on chapter one by getting to the point 1.1.1.4 and then clicking on the link that brought up this Word doc. In this Word doc we've got the link for vir Oracle VirtualBox, we've also got the link for the virtual machine image. Um, now I've already downloaded that virtual machine image because it was 3 gig and I didn't want to do that while I'm still streaming so that could have been a bit slow. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to VirtualBox, I'm going to go to File, it comes across as what's known as an OVA, I can go to Import Appliance and then search for the OVA. And that's a bit worrying, it says VirtualBox supports in OVF format, hopefully it will support OVA as well. Um, otherwise we could have a little bit of a problem there. I'll go to Downloads, CCNA CyberOps, there's the OVA, next, yeah that's all looking good. Okay, so um, it's the CyberOps workstation, it's based on Arch Linux, 64-bit version of the Arch Linux distribution. Um, in this virtual machine we have one CPU, we have uh, 1024 megabytes, or in other words uh, one gigabyte of RAM, that's all good to go. Um, Excellent. Okay, so you can see the settings on here. I'm going to generate MAC new MAC addresses for all interfaces. It's probably the safest thing to do. So our hardware addresses on all our network adapters will be new hardware addresses. And then we'll just hit import. And what should happen, it shouldn't take very long either. Um, this system has two big SSD drives in it and it's a fairly fast system so it should not take too long to install and that will give us our CyberOps virtual machine. Okay, less than half a minute left. and then we should have our CyberOps virtual machine. And there it is. Powered off currently. Um, we can have a little look at the settings on that uh, machine. Giga RAM, 16 giga video memory. There's our virtual hard drives on SATA port 0 and port 1. Looking good. Network is uh, currently set up as uh, bridged network, so it's bridged to the real network card in my PC. Now I'm not entirely sure whether that's actually the right card, but uh, we'll have a little look. So if I go into network, bridge adapter, that's what I want. You probably will find you need to change the bridge adapter to your own PC's card. Um, that's my Ethernet card. I believe I've got a couple of USB to Ethernet adapters, and then that's my wireless card there. Typical Linux 
naming scheme for a wireless card WLP7S0 okay. Okay. that's better so at least it's bridged to my proper wireless card now so this is good this is good um, in fact hold on a second what I'm going to do I'm just going to go into my terminal window I'm not entirely sure whether it's the wireless card that I'm getting to the internet on I better just check that so this is the terminal window on my actual Linux laptop, the one I'm streaming the videos from. I'm going to type IPA, which is short for IP address, and then we'll have a little look. And yeah, the wireless card doesn't have anything on it, and it's down. It's a good job I checked. Um, I'm actually plugged into the internet via my wired connection, ENO1. Good. Okay. Um, so if I want to get out to the internet with this virtual machine, I will have to bridge it to ENO1, which I think was the one it selected initially. There we go. Right, and then I can start that virtual machine up. In fact, we'll do that. Let's see what happens. <laughs> it's always a frightening thing when uh, you're doing a live streaming session and you turn around and say, let's see what happens. Um, here we go, something's going on. Hey, we're there. That was pretty quick. That loaded fast. You can see that a username is Analyst. And what was our uh, password? That's a very good question, Kevin. What was our password? Ah, password Cyberops. Nice and easy. And there we go. We're ready. So there you go. You've now got a virtual machine ready to go on your system. Um, and obviously the other virtual machines are installed in exactly the same sort of way. Um, if I bring up a terminal window, you can see that we've got the Cyberops terminal window there. I'm sorry, but the text is a little bit small on there. Um, can I can I modify the text size on there? I'll zoom in, give me. Oh, kind of. Um, there we go. So on here, we can have a look at the IP addresses. Um, we can let's see how much memory we've got installed. Yeah, we're using a 174 meg of memory. Um, I mean, uh, there's various things that we can do, but it's just basically a bog standard Linux system. We can look at the file system. So the hard drive, the main hard drive is uh, 9.8 gig, so that would have been a 10 gig. Only 53% is in use. Um, oh yeah, it's, it's, it's a functional machine ready to go. Cyberops. And then we've got some of their specialist programs on here. Idle, Skite, Wireshark. Superb. Wireshark. Oh, that's interesting. Let's fire up Wireshark. There you go. How about that? It's all in there. Um, let's start a capture. Cisco Remote Capture Random Packet Generate SSH Remote. That's interesting. I can't actually see which one of those I would have said. None of those were actually my interface that I need to actually capture on at the moment. There's a root password on this thing. It's been a little while since I played with it. There is a root password. I wonder what it is. Um. <laughs> okay. Uh. The key thing is with these things is just to play with them. Yeah. But you can see how easily we can get a virtual machine up and running. And of course, you can create your own virtual machines as well. Ah, oh, we can do a sudo by the looks of things. I don't suppose we can do it on a, how we would do it on a Raspberry Pi. Pseudo SU. Ah, uh, hold on. My fault. So, Cyberops. There you go, we're now the root user. 
bit of very very uh, elementary hacking there. Um, <laughs> okay, so we're now the root user. I can type, who am I? It tells me I'm the root user. I wonder if I want run Wireshark as this user. Will it? Uh, I'm going to type Wireshark. It's GTK version, so this is the GNOME toolkit. So this gives us a graphical interface, uh, the proper style of graphical interface. Um, I'm going to put the ampersand on the end to run Wireshark in the background. Don't worry about that error. You always get that with Wireshark when you run it as root. Run as root could be dangerous. I really don't care. Hey, now we can see the proper interfaces on this system. Okay, so run as root, and we can now see the proper interfaces. That looks to me like the interface that is actually got uh, a network connection on it. Yeah, there's definitely something coming through there. Um, if we bring up an application, have we got a Firefox? There we go, bring up Firefox. And um, we'll just do a search for something. Uh, BBC News. There we go. So that's going to go out to some browser, probably Google. Yes, Google. BBC News website. And um, not sure what Boris is up to there. He's probably winding somebody up. Um, and there we go. Lots and lots of packets. Over 10,000 packets captured already. Okay, we can stop air capture. And you can see that there's been some secure web traffic coming across. TLS, Transport Layer Security. Secure Sockets Layer. DNS requests, queries, various things that were on that website, probably inside frames. Um, so what is Wireshark? Wireshark is a packet capture tool. It allows us to capture packets and analyze them to look inside. And this is free software. Absolutely free software. Anyway, I won't get you too tied up with the virtual machines, but hopefully um, anybody who's never used Vir Oracle VirtualBox before, you'll see it's a pre pretty straightforward piece of software to use. Um, I don't want to cancel, shut the whole machine down. There we go. Um, if you're running it on Windows, it's just a matter of going to Oracle's website, downloading the executable, and then really basically doing a next, next, next finish. And you'll have Oracle VirtualBox running. And then to import your OVA file, the one you download from the uh, link on that Word doc, it's just a matter of going to Import Appliance, and point it at the OVA, and don't forget to change the MAC address on your network adapters as well. Okay, um, log out, shut down, and away it goes. Boom. Right, so that's that done. That's that's nice and relatively straightforward. Um, while we're here, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Um, I've downloaded a Debian ISO, and uh, I'll do an install of a Debian ISO. Um, so Debian being another version of Linux, it's useful sometimes to make your own um, virtual machines in addition to the ones that are already on the course. I, in, its, in its own right, it's a useful thing to be able to do. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to call this virtual machine Debian, which means it will probably guess it's Linux. It does. It's Debian 64-bit Linux. So the operating system is Linux. It's 64-bit Debian is the version. We'll click Next. Um, I'll put 2 gig of RAM on this one. Okay, This computer's actually got 32 gig of RAM in it, so it's a drop in the ocean in that respect. Um, we'll add a virtual hard drive. So this is how you go about creating your own virtual machine. I'll leave it at the default virtual disk image, virtual box disk image. Um, dynamically allocated purely means that um, it will allow the file that simulates the hard drive on the computer to grow as the guest operating system's hard drive gets bigger. So instead of us using up a great big block of space and only using a small portion of it for a guest operating system uh, we can actually have a dynamic hard drive file on a host computer and as the guest operating system's hard drive gets more and more full that um, dynamic host file which is a hard drive will expand in accordance to that okay I'm just gonna leave it at 8 gig and we'll do a create okay so 
that looks very good um, 2 gig of RAM uh, what I do need to do is I need to point the optical drive at the Debian image so I'm going to go to choose disk image um, and I'll go to downloads CCNA CyberOps and there's my Debian net install ISO now where did I get that from? I just went to Google, typed in Debian went to the downloads link and looked for the small net install ISOs I found the one for the AMD64 which is basically a 64-bit Intel or AMD processor um, and away you go um, we'll set the network to bridged and I will bridge it to my Ethernet, my wired Ethernet network card. Bridged will allow the network card to appear on the real network so your your virtual guest will appear on your real network uh, with a real world IP address on your network rather than using something like NAT. Okay and then we'll start that one up. We'll do a um, standard install instead of a graphical one. Okay, um, English, United Kingdom keyboard, British English keyboard. Just run my way through this for a little bit. Once it gets to uh, a bit where it might be a bit slow, we'll move on to the PowerPoint presentations. But I'd like to create a Linux system from scratch, just so as I can show you. Um, a few little tricks that you can do rather than use the one that uh, has been pre-built for us. So it's going to try to do an IPv4 and an IPv6 configuration. Um, it should succeed via DHCP because my home router uh, will give it an IP address. I'll give it as the hostname Debian which is default, no domain name. I'll tap in a root password, something simple for the moment. I'm just going to put the bottom row of the keyboard backwards not the recommended password but it just keeps it simple on a virtual machine I'll tap in my username, my full username from that it will guess a username which uh, in Linux usernames should be lowercase with no spaces so Kevin will do I'll tap in a password for the normal user which I'll make QWERTY away it goes. Next thing it will ask me to do is for partitioning the hard drive. Um, I will use the entire hard disk. Um, it shows up as a um, SATA hard drive effectively speaking. Um, I'll select that. I'll put all files in one partition. It's just the easiest way to get going. I'll finish partitioning and write the changes to the disk. There's a little double check there. Do you really want to do this? Yes. And there's the hard drive partitioned. And now what it will do is it will install a base system and from there we can go on to creating the machine. This will create, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to create a command line Linux system and then turn it into an FTP server um, so that we can have a little play with that. We could perhaps uh, connect to the FTP server and capture the username and password for instance which some people probably will have already done but many people will have never seen anything like that so if you haven't we'll use Wireshark to capture a clear text protocol such as FTP and we'll be able to pull the username and password out of the packets. It's always nice to do a something like that as a little demonstration. Okay so that's installed in the base operating system. Um, like I say um, once it gets to a part where it's going to go really slow um, which is not quite yet um, we'll move back to the PowerPoint slides. There aren't a huge number of PowerPoint slides in this chapter Okay, let's just put the kernel on. The kernel being the uh, the heart of the operating system, the bit that talks directly to the hardware. Users don't normally communicate directly to the kernel. They normally communicate through a shell, a graphical shell or a command line shell. And then the shell will communicate with the kernel. It's best for normal users not to talk to the kernel because they can break things very easily. Hackers often talk directly to the kernel though. Do I wish to scan another CD or DVD? No. I'll select the country for my archive mirror, in other words where I'll get my software from, which will be the nearest country to me, so I'm in the UK so I'll do that. Um, deb.debian.org I would imagine that should do as a site to pull my software from, no proxy server. should now go off and scan the mirror and retrieve the package managers files which will contain um, 
up to date software and where I go and get it from. So when I install any packages, um, it'll always install the most up to date software packages and it knows where to get them from. So we'll do a select and install software. In a moment it's going to run what's called task cell, which is the task selector. Um, that will give me like a, um, a little template. Do I want to be part of the popularity contest? This is just so as it has some kind of feedback on what packages are being used. I'll say no to that one. Here comes task cell. Task cell will give me some pre-built definitions. So do I want a desktop interface? I'll use the spacebar to get rid of the star by the side of that one. I don't want a desktop interface. Um, I'll put the SSH server on, so I'll hit the spacebar to do that. So standard system utilities, SSH server, print server, why not? Web server, yeah, why not? But we don't want a desktop interface, we'll just say command line only. So just select them with the spacebar or deselect them with the spacebar. Hit continue. And it's now going to pull 358 packages off of the internet. It's already pulled more than 100 of them, only seconds remaining. If I'd have selected a graphical user interface, it would have needed to pull well over a thousand packages. What we will do is, once this starts installing this software, um, I will go back to the PowerPoint presentations and have a little look through there. There we go. So it's pulled the software, it's now unpacking the software, and it should go along through the installation process and my goodness me that is installed in it fast. This is one of the good things about having an i7 Extreme processor, 32 gig of RAM and two big SSD drives. Um, it uh, does seriously help when you're using virtual machines. Okay, so you should, if you've never used it before, now have some idea of what Oracle VirtualBox is. Um, very, very useful piece of software allowing you to run guest operating systems inside your host operating system. And of course, if you break the guest operating system, it's no big deal. Uh, it won't do any damage to the host operating system. I'm just looking at this. This is running so fast, I think I might just carry on. Um, so what we're doing now is we are configuring a lot of the packages that we've pulled. Now let's go back to the PowerPoint presentations and have a quick look see where we've got them there. Okay, so we've installed the CyberOps virtual machine. Uh, we've installed Oracle VirtualBox, we've imported the CyberOps virtual machine, that was pretty straightforward to do. Um, let's have a little look at the threat actors. What are, th uh, what are termed actors? We have, um, we have good actors and we have bad actors. Um, one of the threat actors that we have is the amateurs, often known as script kiddies. Now a script kiddie will have little or virtually no skill whatsoever, uh, but they will use very powerful existing tools and instructions that are found on the internet to launch attacks. There is some phenomenally powerful uh, computer software out there and there are step-by-step -step instructions on the internet on how to use these things. And unfortunately, what the script kiddies will often do is sometimes out of um, interest or just uh, curiosity, they will launch an attack not realizing just how much damage they can do on the other end. We have hacktivists. And a hacktivist is someone who's going to protest against an organization or governments. Um, a fairly obvious hacktivist would be the anonymous, for instance. The anonymous, um, by its very definition, um, few, very few people know anybody who's actually in the anonymous, and um, they will often target governments, um, government departments. Um, for instance, they targeted the CIA a few years back. Um, this is this illustrates one of the things with the internet. Um, the internet is a, an environment which crosses national boundaries. Um, you can have action at a distance. You could be located anywhere in the world and you could effectively attack any organization from your location anonymously. And it also has a great uh, asymmetry as well, the internet. Um, 
back in the past if you wanted to take down the FBI or the CIA um, you would have had to have been an extremely powerful entity yourself however now you don't need to do that um, you can actually do damage that uh, vastly outweighs your actual physical footprint on the internet you could be a single individual somebody just tapping away in your bedroom and you could potentially cause major havoc to a government organization um, tens of millions of pounds of damage um, totally and utterly um, outweighing your physical presence um, and you can do this anonymously very scary stuff okay so hacktivists they will post articles and videos they will quite often leak information um, Wikipedia, uh, WikiLeaks Algerian Assange uh, very useful uh, very often um, leaking information um, until he was uh, <laughs> caught up with much of hacking activity is motivated by financial gain so now we're talking about cyber criminals this is another threat actor category and they want to generate a cash flow so they're in it for the money and um, they will do this by targeting bank accounts and not only bank accounts but personal data and anything else that they can leverage and then of course we've got yet another threat actor and that would be trade secrets and global politics so in this case we're talking about nation states that are interested in using cyberspace either to hack into other countries infrastructure or possibly to interfere with internal politics I, mean, I don't know how many times we've been told that um, you know, various elections have been interfered with by various countries around the world um, industrial espionage, espionage getting hold of uh, companies trade secrets and gaining significant advantage in any international trade and then looking forward to the Internet of Things so the Internet of Things is actually ever expanding um, it's incredible how many things are now physically uh, and logically connected to the Internet uh, we don't just mean things like computers and servers and routers and switches and smartphones but um, things like um, sensors um, and uh, you know your fridge and your alarm system and GPS sensors and weather sensors and all kinds of various things like that um, this is designed to improve our quality of life for instance we've got fitness trackers uh, many of these will uh, use global positioning systems and um, they'll connect to the internet to download or upload software uh, many m medical devices as well um, however how secure are these devices the firmware on these devices are there vulnerabilities in them do we have security for uh, flaws um, can we update the devices with a patch they do talk about in the chapter um, October 2016 okay that was only about three years ago there was a DDoS attack a di distributed denial of service attack against the domain name provider Dyn and this took out many popular websites and the attack itself actually came from of all things a large number of webcams digital video recorders and routers and other IOT devices that have been compromised by malicious software these devices formed a botnet or a, effectively a robot network that was being controlled by hackers and that botnet was used to create an enormous distributed denial of service attack disabled the essential internet services provided by Dyn so not only do we need to make sure we protect things that we think are obvious but we also need to think about the internet of things impact of threats uh, we've got personal identifier identifiable information so this is any information that can be used positively to identify an individual so these are things like your name your social security number credit card details etc government issued identification um, this information is bought and sold on the darknet 
and it's used for creating fake accounts such as fake credit cards or short-term loans. Much of this money actually is diverted to terrorist organisations. We have a subset of uh, PII, which is PHI, or Pers uh, Protected Health Information, and this is where we are looking at uh, the creation and the maintenance of electrical med sorry electronic medical records. Okay, so one of the worst attacks I think I can remember it only happened two or three years ago. We had a situation where there was a cyber attack on the National Health Service in the UK, um, and this caused immense problems. Um, now, obviously. Air National Health Service is there to protect the citizens of this country um, in their hour of need. Um, these are the doctors and the nurses that do such a wonderful job um, looking after us and how people could have had the audacity <laughs> to attack uh, such a system um, is, is beyond uh, most people. But, of course, this illustrates the fact that when it comes to systems on the internet, the zeros and ones that make up this binary information, they're all the same. You can't tell the difference between zeros and ones that represent critical healthcare information from zeros and ones that represent somebody listening to an internet radio station or something else. Um, they are precisely the same, and the vulnerabilities that exist on the internet, and these stem from its early inception, um, because the internet is an open network, and it was designed for super efficient flow and communication of data. It wasn't designed from the ground up with security in mind. It was designed with efficiency in mind, and that has caused major, major problems. Uh, Competitive loss advantage, uh, a loss of competitive advantage, I should say. So, uh, corporate espionage in cyberspace, um, this can result in a loss of trust. So, when a company is unable to protect its customers' personal details, again, this is something that's happened many, many times recently. Um, we've had situations where um, the uh, trade secrets of a certain organization have leaked out and this has meant that um, people have lost trust in that organization in dealing with it. And of course then we've moved on to politics and national security. So 2016 we had a hacker publish the personal inf identity information of uh, 20,000 US FBI employees, 9,000 US Department of Health Services employees. We've got the famous Stuxnet worm that we already talk, talked about, which uh, was designed to impede uh, the Iranian uh, progress in enriching uranium. Um, cyber warfare is a very serious uh, possibility. In fact, it's not a serious possibility. Cyber warfare happens. There's no question whatsoever about it. Um, there are apparently entire divisions of um, more than one country around the world where cyber warfare um, is is what they do that's what the uh, the division is in charge of uh, doing and it can disrupt a nation's economy and the safety of its citizens right before we look at the elements of a security operations center let's just pop back to the Linux system because that will now be installed almost installed it's actually stopped at this point for some time while I've been talking what we now need to do is we need to do the final part of the installation very very quick. We're going to install what's known as the Grand Unified Bootloader or GRUB. The bootloader basically tells the system where to go off and find the operating system. So the GRUB bootloader will be installed onto the master boot record of the hard disk and uh, it's basically a pointer to where you go to load the operating system. Um, oops. Excuse me. In the window there. Okay, so we'll uh, stick it on Dev SDA. So that's a device S for SATA, D for disk, A for the first drive. The Dev SDA, the first hard drive on the system. The Grub bootloader. 
and that's pretty much it. We'll be able to reboot the system. Installation is complete. We can reboot the system and we have a working Linux operating system. We'll change that into a FTP server very shortly. You will learn quite a lot of Linux. Um, not the next chapter, but um, the one after that is devoted to Linux. So we can see we've got a system up now, Debian login. I will log in as the user Kevin. The password of QWERTY. And we're in the system. We'll type SU, switch user. And the bottom row of the keyboard backwards from M to Z, uh, root user password. And I've now switched to the root user. My prompt has changed to a hash. I'll type who am I. And you can see I'm now the root user. I'll type CD to change to my currently logged in user's home directory. So I'll change from the Kevin directory to the root directory. I can type PWD, which will give me some idea of where I am. Print working directory will tell you where you are in the file system. So I'm now located in the root folder, which is my root user's home directory. Um, I'll type IPA to show the IP addresses on this system. Uh, we see we've got a loopback interface, LO, with the address 127.0.0.1. And we also have an Ethernet interface, ENPOS3, with an IP address of 192.168.50.78. Okay. I will do an apt update to pull the latest package file off the system. It says all packages are up to date. They should be, because I've only just installed the system. And now what we'll do is we'll run a command ss minus tln which will look at listening sockets. A socket is a combination of an IP address and a port number. We will get into that further into the, in the networking chapter. But basically we can see that we have port 80, port 22. So these are well-known port numbers. Port 80 is for a web server, port 22 is for SSH. In fact if I run that command and I take the n off the end we should see SSH and HTTP is now turned around and told us the protocols in use. HTTP, Hypertext Transfer Protocol for web servers. SSH, the protocol secure shell for SSH servers. That's looking good. Okay, so uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to apt install VSFTPD, very secure file transfer protocol daemon. That's a uh, FTP server. That's installed. That's how quickly you can install software on a, Linux, on a Linux machine. So you can see why security professionals and hackers like Linux machines. That probably took about three to four seconds to install an FTP server on this system. It was done simply by typing apt install vsftpd. I'll run the ss-tl command again and you'll see that we now have a FTP line. It's the third line up from the bottom saying the FTP protocol is now listening on this computer. If I put TLN, it will give me that numerically. An FTP listens on port number 21. Okay, so we have an FTP server on the IP address 192.168.50.78. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to see if I can connect to that. I'm just going to see if I've got FileZilla installed on here. Um, internet. Can't see it on there. So what we'll do is we'll go to settings and we'll go to software updater and we'll install FileZilla. Do a search. FileZilla is an FTP client. Helps when you can spell it properly. File Zilla. There we go. Uh, you can see it is not installed, so I will now install that. Apply. Take my password. Okay, it will install FileZilla. Apply, and away we go. Wow, it's installed already. As quick as that. Okay. Notice no serial numbers or anything like that. This is open source software. Right. 
Now what I'm going to do now is let's see if we've got FileZilla installed now. There it is. As quick as that. Um, I remember that IP address, 192.168.50.78. Let's see if we can connect to it. Okay. Host. 192.168.50.78. That's my little virtual machine that's in the background here. Um, we'll use the username, system user, so that's Kevin, with a password of QWERTY. And we'll just see if we can connect. The server does not support FTP over TLS. If you continue, your password and file will be sent in clear text over the internet. <laughs> it's just giving me a warning that the password is going to be sent in clear text over the internet. But I'm going to say, that's okay. Because it's a de demonstration, I want to show you this. Okay, so we have connected from a client running on my laptop, the one I'm streaming the videos from, to a virtual machine running also on the laptop, but this is a separate computer running in Oracle VirtualBox. Um, in fact, if I run that command sstln again, um, actually that's, I want not listening sockets, but established sockets, so ten, we can see that we've actually got a connection established between 192.168.50.78 and 192.168.50.240. Ah, however, that is on the wrong port number. That, believe it or not, is my printer. It's the second line down is the one we want. 192.168.50.78 on port 21, that's FTP, to 192.168.50.73. So we do have a connection established. Now what I'm going to do is, uh, let's see if I can prove that there's a connection established here. I'm going to go into the Kevin folder here, um, and it's empty at the moment. I'll go into my virtual machine, um, and I'll cd into home Kevin, and I'll just make a directory called test1, um, and then what we'll do is we'll see if we can see that. funny, I can't see it. <laughs> Test one. Ah, refresh. Just had to hit the refresh button up the top there. Okay, so you can see that I'm actually in this remote machine in the right hand window pane. Okay, what we're going to do now is I'm going to disconnect and I'll show you how dangerous it is running an insecure protocol. So, where's my quick disconnect on here? server disconnect there we go okay so we've disconnected and what I'm going to do is I'm going to run Wireshark we will capture the connection between the FTP client FileZilla and the FTP server okay we'll go very slightly over time on this one but hopefully not by much I'm going to open up my terminal window in Linux and I'm going to run Wireshark as the root user I've become the root user now, um, and I will run Wireshark with an ampersand on the end, so as it detaches from this session, from this terminal window. Okay. That basically simply means that I can still use the terminal window. Wireshark's running in the background in the terminal window. Um, and it's going to be ENO1 I'm going to want to listen to. So... Uh, Okay, there's probably quite a lot of stuff shooting up there. So what we'll do is we'll do a stop of that and we'll run it again just as we're about to connect. That's going to be the way to do it so as we don't have huge numbers of packets in the background there. I hope you can still see that. Okay. Right, 
right, let's get ready to connect. There's their quick connect button. I'm going to continue. Okay, and then we'll connect. And we're connected. And I'll stop the packet capture. And then we'll inspect to see what we've managed to capture with Wireshark. Right, let's have a little look. What we now need to do is we need to look for FTP traffic. So we can do a filter. Uh, let's see if we can filter for FTP. Uh, yeah, that looks reasonable. Okay. Um, in fact, that looks very reasonable. If we have a little look, we can see that uh, it's pulled the username, Kevin, and the password, QWERTY. So this is why you have to be so incredibly careful when you're using clear text protocols. And in fact, what we should be able to do is we should be able to right click on that stream and go to follow TCP stream. And there we go. Authentication request, please log in with the username and password. There's my username, Kevin. There's my password, QWERTY. Okay, so that was just a very quick demonstration of how insecure standard FTP is. Don't use FTP, use something like SFTP. Um, but um, that was done using a completely free piece of software, Wireshark. What we'll do is we'll shut this system down. Uh, ah, now, yeah. Latest version of Debian. System CTL in front. That's it. System CTL power off, and that will be gone. That's now powered off. So you see the fun you can have playing around with virtual machine software. Alright, uh, let's have a little look at the people who live in a security operations centre. We have the Tier 1 Alert Analyst. We have the Tier 2 Incident Responder. We have the Tier 3 Subject Meta Expert. And then we have the SOC Manager, the Security Operations Centre Manager. So Security Operations Centre revolves around people, technology and processes and the key people are the people you'll see in this diagram. At level 1, level 2 and level 3. Okay, The tier 1 alert analyst, these professionals will monitor incoming alerts, verify that uh, a true incident has actually occurred and forward the tickets to tier 2 if necessary. The tier 2 incident responder, these are professionals which are responsible for deep investigation of the incidents and advise remediation or action to be taken. The Tier 3 subject matter expert or hunter, these professionals have expert level skill in network, endpoint, threat analysis and malware reverse engineering. There's some serious skills there. These are the experts that uh, trace the process, uh, the malware, to determine its impact and how it can be removed. And then we have the SOC manager who it basically manages all the resources of the security operations center and serves as a central point contact for larger organizations or customers. Okay, so tier one begins monitoring the alert. Tier one analyst will verify if the alert represents a true security incident and then the incident can be forwarded on to investigators or resolved as a false alarm. Deep investigation and advises remediation action at tier 2 and if it's progressed up to tier 3 this is where we're using in-depth knowledge, threat hunting, threat hunting and preventative measures. Okay so the technologies in the security operations center now the security operations center should run what's known as the Security Information and Event Management System 
and its job is to collect and filter data, to detect and classify threats, to analyze and investigate threats, to implement preventative measures and to address any future threats. Okay, sorry about that, the uh, PowerPoint was running a bit slow there. Enterprise and managed security, so organisations may implement an enterprise level security operations centre. So for medium and large networks, uh, the organisation could benefit from an enterprise level security operations centre. Now this could be a completely in-house solution, however in many larger organisations they will outsource at least part of the security operations centre to a security solutions provider. Now of course Cisco has their own set of experts who are there to ensure timely and accurate incidents resolution. So we're talking about things like Cisco SmartNet Total Care Service, uh, Cisco Product Security Incident Response Team, the Cisco Computer Security Incident Response Team, CSERT, Cisco Managed Services, the Cisco Tactical Operations or TACOPS, and Cisco Safety and Physical Security Program. Right, security versus availability. We've got to balance things now. Um, you could have the most secure network in the world virtually impossible to break into. However, it could be so secure that your users cannot physically do the jobs that they are designed to they're trying to do. So we have to have a certain amount of balance between security and availability and also usability of the network. Now with regards to availability your network should be up and running at all times so preferred uptime, this is measured in minutes per year, um, most often quoted as five nines uptime. This simply means that the network is available 99.999 percent of the time, five nines. So therefore it's down for no more than five minutes a year. Now many networks these days will actually go to six nines where it's down for around about 31.5 seconds a year. How do we get that level of availability? Numerous ways. Um, one is by having a very good level of security in place. Another one is by making sure that we have redundant devices and redundant links in case of failures. Um, so if we want to become a defender, certifications, this is uh, just a wrap up now. Um, we've got a variety of cyber security certifications available. So we've got the CCNA CyberOps, yes! And we've also got the CompTIA Cyber Security Analyst Certification, or the CSA Plus. Another very nice certification. We've got ISC Squared um, certifications, um, including what's known as the CISSP. That is an extremely high level um, security certification. If I remember correctly, I did speak to a guy who's actually taken that. It's a six hour exam. Yeah, exactly. A six hour exam. If you're a CISSP, yeah, you really do know your stuff. Um, Global Information Assured Certification, GIAC, also provides some high level security certifications. It's always good to have a certification behind you. Um, further education, you could consider pursuing a technical degree or bachelor's degree in computer science. Um, computer program, programming is an essential skill. Um, Python is again routinely used in cybersecurity an analysts. Um, oh boy. Um, sources for career information. Now, obviously, if you're a teacher or instructor or a trainer, um, this is the information that you would want to get across to your students who are doing this course. Um, I was absolutely over the moon. One of my students just recently has got himself an extremely good job at a, um, a financial security company. <laughs> oh, I tell you what, when, when he told me, I was absolutely over the moon. He's worked very, very hard for it, um, so it's wonderful to see. Um, but yeah, sources of career information deed.com and so on. LinkedIn's quite useful. It's amazing how many uh, opportunities you can get um, if you've got your contacts sorted out at LinkedIn. And 
ways of getting experience for your students, internships. Um, again, another one of my students was lucky enough to get an internship at Mareki, the cloud service provider. Um, I've had uh, another student who had an internship for uh, a year at uh, Cisco's uh, uh, CVS Center down in Reading, uh, where he worked on multi-million pound networks for the likes of British Telecom. Can't tell me anything else about it, because of course it's all trade secrets. But uh, internships are very useful. Cisco have a cyber security scholarship, um, temp agencies, and so on. Okay, now, uh, what I'd like to say is this is a very straightforward chapter. Um, it's a little bit bitty, so there's little bits of various things that come into this chapter. It's not one nice, coherent, uh, homologous um, chapter. Um, unlike the later chapters where we will go deeper, but in one particular subject. Um, so that's all we've got for this chapter. Uh, would like to say thank you very much indeed for joining us. Um, next week we go on with uh, chapter 2 where we look at the Windows operating system. So that will be on the 23rd of September at 8 o'clock. We overshot very slightly by 10 minutes there. I hope that wasn't a big problem. Um, as I say, thanks very much for joining me uh, for this session and possibly any of the other sessions that you might have tuned into. Um, I'm going to go and find a nice quiet corner to have a pint of Guinness in now and calm down and um, I will see you on the 23rd of September at 8 o'clock for Chapter 2, the Windows Operating System. Best wishes to you all.